thank you so much for joining us this evening um, at another MagLab Open House live virtual session. Um, tonight, we are going to hear from Carlos Villa about the story of attraction, some history and all the way up to modern times, right, Carlos, about you know how researchers are um, fascinated by electricity and magnetism and you know what those I don't know, amazing things are telling us about the world. Um, so I just want to kind of frame everything for you. We have the chat open here. So feel free to ask questions or let us know who you are, that you're here um, in the chat if you'd like. Uh, there's a couple of, or there's a link rather already here in case you haven't found our open house central location on the MagLabs website. That's where all of our uh, upcoming scheduled events and our video demonstrations and our tours and uh, games are all located. In fact, there's a scavenger hunt game that's live right now. And uh, the person who finishes it with the most correct answers and the fastest time wins a shrunken quarter. So that's always a highly coveted open house prize. And we've years kept it this year, even in the virtual space. <laughs> I still don't have my shrunken quarter. I've been at the lab almost 20 years. You think I would have earned one, but no. No, and you're not eligible for this one because you could do it pretty quickly, Carlos. But for the rest of you, uh, you go ahead online and complete that open house scavenger hunt. And uh, we'll let you know if you've won. There'll actually be prizes for more than just the first place winner, but that quarter is gonna be one of those coveted prizes only for the top finisher. So uh, welcome again, and thank you for joining us. And Carlos, I'll let you take it away. Well, thanks. Kirsten, I appreciate it. Um, so my name is Carlos Arvia, and we are doing the story of attraction today. So I'm gonna start with the Mag Lab. You're probably sitting there like, who are you? So let me tell you who I am. Uh, my name is Carlos Arvia, and I am a Mag Lab educator. I'm also a husband and father of two, so that's my little family there. Uh, I'm an FSU grad two times. I am a born Nicaraguan, proud of that. I'm also a lover of science. And if you really want to know me, I'm a big Transformers collector. I've got Starscream here. I've got, see, I, he's in the picture. He's always here next to me. So I've got Starscream here with me. I'm also a big Disney fan. And if you understand Experiment 626, we can be friends. Um, and that's just who I am. Uh, I also want to remind everyone, February 27th at 4 p.m., we'll have the first virtual escape room, which they do not tell me anything about. So I'm excited to do the escape room with my family because I've been left out of the loop. So I get to participate and do it for the first time with all of you. Um, just a quick, what is the Mag Lab for everyone? Um, the National Mag Lab is one of seven magnet labs in the entire world. And by magnet labs, we mean high magnetic field laboratories. We're the only one on this side of the planet. And the last time I said this, the uh, was it the Dutch Mag Lab was online with us? Yeah, one of the European Magnet Labs, the Nijmegen Lab mm -hmm, in the Netherlands. In the Netherlands. So that was fantastic. Um, but we are the largest and the highest powered, and they can't argue with, that on, with us on that. Um, so that's who we are. We are a user laboratory. So that is that means that we operate the magnets so that scientists can come in do experiments, do their research, do everything, and then they get to go back home with all their data so a new set of scientists can come in. And in 2019, we had over 2,000 different users visit us. So that was a um, good year. That's about average, isn't it, Kristen? Yeah, about average. I mean, every year is, every year is a record, but about 2,000 is, uh, is starting to become normal. <laughs> Uh, we are funded by the National Science Foundation and the state of Florida, and that's important. Uh, and of course, the budget for the last year was $58 million, uh, 58.8, I believe. And that does not count money for the scientists. We don't charge the scientists to use the magnets. It is free to use the magnets on the condition that the research is shared. We are not a business. We're not turning a profit. We are expanding and enhancing and furthering scientific knowledge. So that's what we are all about. Um, and the big misconception, everybody comes up to me and asks me is, hey, you guys do magnet stuff. Is that all you do? And it's not even close to just magnet stuff. Uh, materials, energy, and life are the big three that we always, that a lot of our stuff falls under. Um, material science being probably the number one thing that we research, but there's lots of physics and engineering and chemistry. 
biology, some biomedical stuff. We've got some COVID-19 samples right now. We've got some pharmaceutical samples, geochemistry, oceanography. I've seen paleontology and psychology, uh, a little bit of every ology you could possibly imagine going on at the MAG lab. Uh, and of course, we have three different locations. This is the main site in Tallahassee and the largest of the three sites, but we've also got labs in Los Alamos and we have labs in the University of Florida. So between all three of those, we are three uh, locations, but one lab. This is one of my favorite maps to show off. I mentioned the users just a second ago. This is where they're coming from. So if you trace the red lines to right here, these are scientists coming to Los Alamos. The purple dot right there is Tallahassee and the blue dot down there is the University of Florida. So these are scientists coming to those three sites from the US. And of course the bottom part here is scientists coming to us from the entire world. And we've got scientists from around the world and occasionally a scientist comes, has such a great time. We end up hiring them, they stick around, gives us a very international lab and that's a lot of fun. I've got friends from every continent. I love saying that. I've got friends that live in all these different countries and it's great. And I'll say it's a lot of fun during the Olympics and World Cup um, and Tour de France, which gets kind of lost in, with all the American sports, but Tour de France is a really big deal in Europe. Um, and I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't talked to all my European friends. So this is the map. Um, and like I said, I've got uh, my friend Marta from Colombia. I'm from Nicaragua, Guatemala. I know someone from Jamaica and Turkey and Ukraine and Russia and China and in all these countries, Nigeria, South Africa, it's amazing. Now I do wanna say that the National Mag Lab is taxpayer funded by the NSF and the state of Florida, which makes you, all of everyone visiting and watching tonight, a stakeholder in our facility. So on behalf of all of us, thank you for supporting our science. And I'm going to remind everyone on February 26th, We'll do a scientist speed session. We did one this afternoon. It was a lot of fun. It's one of these anything goes types questions. So if you want to know what scientists are snacking on as they experiment, this is your chance to ask them. What music are they listening to? What are they watching when they go home? What book are they reading um, during breaks in the lab? So uh, we'll have Lissa Anderson, one of our chemists on February 26th. All right, I'm going to take a break, quick pause. Any questions come in, Kristen? No questions, Carlos, but um, I do want to yeah, say to everybody, you know, Carlos talked about all the different scientists that use magnets um, across materials and energy and life and physicists and chemists and paleo oceanographers and all of these different scientists. And uh, we're featuring a diverse subset of them with the scientist speed session. So come and hear about their research and, you know, ask them quirky questions about all kinds of stuff. They're kind of like, uh, ask me anything. And um, our scientists this morning, uh, I thought played along really well, as I expect all of them too. So uh, come on, bring your quirky questions and uh, we'd love to put scientists on the spot and ask them for you. So <laughs> I did appreciate Matt Eddy's choice of movies. I thought that was uh, not, not only did he give us his favorites, he gave us his guilty pleasures. And that was just nice to have that little insider info. All right, let's do a little bit of science. All right, let me reach over here. I've got a couple magnets that I can show off here. So all right, everybody, just a quick reminder, um, good stuff to know for the rest of the uh, week. All magnets have poles, all right? I've got my magnet right here. And if you look at mine here, I've got the purple and the red end. Red is my north, purple is my south. So all magnets have north and south. And if I bring the north and south next to each other, oops, too far. If I bring the north and south next to each other, they're going to attract. They do not stick. This is called attracting. And if I put the same side next to each other, in this case, south and south, they're gonna repel away from each other. It's gonna completely try and flip that one around. So we have repelling with the same sides and opposites attract. The reason they do that is because magnets have magnetic fields. And this is again, something that all magnets are gonna have. So all magnets have the magnetic field and what a lot of people don't realize is the field has a direction. It comes from the north goes out through space and comes back into the south. And that's where the field is moving. It's moving from the north to the south. And that's important because one of the big questions everybody asks me is why do magnets attract? And it's because of the direction of the field. If you look here, the north and south are next to each other and the fields are going the same direction. So they kind of join and continue on to bring the magnets next to each other and make them connect. And so that's called attracting. Likewise, if we take a south and south or a north and north, those fields are going against each other. So it's not working the way you want it to. And so they push against each other. And so we call that repelling. It all has to do with the magnetic field, all right? 
not all metals attract to magnets. I was watching a cartoon of the very famous mouse talking about how their magnet can pick up all types of metal. And I was like, no, no, Mr. Mouse, that's, that's not right. Um, only three types of metal are attracted to magnets. And those three are iron, nickel, and cobalt. And I happen to know a very cool way to remember these three. Check this out. I like movies. I hope you like movies too. And hopefully you've seen this movie. And if you have seen this movie, Monsters, Inc., I don't want you to remember Monsters, Inc., we're going to cross that out. I want you to think about Magnets, Inc. And if you think about Magnets, Inc., I want you to focus on the ink part, because if you think ink, you'll remember that ink will stand for iron, nickel, cobalt. So Magnets, Inc. is a good way to remember which metals are always going to be magnetic, and that's iron and nickel and cobalt, just like that. All right. So how does magnetism work? Here's where we get more advanced, okay? The reason magnetism works is because of the electrons that are inside the iron, nickel, or cobalt. So I've got a piece of iron here, and I've drawn in these little arrows. And what those arrows are representing is the spin or the direction of spin of the electrons. And if you look at this, all the electrons are randomly mixed up, which is normal. That's how electrons normally are. So if you go find a piece of metal and you could see the electrons in that piece of metal, all the electrons would be mixed up. That's the second law of thermodynamics following entropy. This is normal. Chaos is normal. But if you start putting a magnetic field against this piece of iron, those electrons don't stay random. They actually start getting pulled into line. And whenever you get these electrons spinning in the same direction, that's how you produce a magnetic field. So I'm gonna bring my magnet all the way up to my piece of iron and boom, this is what happens to that piece of iron. I've gone from disorganized electrons to electrons spinning the same way. And by no major coincidence, the direction that they are spinning in is also the direction of the field. And if you remember, we just talked about a couple slides ago, the field is going from the north to the south. So therefore, the spin of the electrons points to north and away from south. And that's what makes magnetism work. It's those electrons spinning together that makes magnetism happen. Now, electrons are what makes magnetism work. It's the spin of those electrons. But electrons also make electricity work. And it's the movement of electrons. So we talk about magnetism. We're going to talk about electricity. And then we're going to take a little journey all together through the history of electromagnetism. So we've got this thing called DC electricity, where electricity flows in one direction through the wire. And because all the electrons are flowing in the same direction, they are lined up. And because they're lined up, there is a magnetic field around them. So everywhere that you've got a wire that carries electricity, like this purple wire here, you're gonna have a magnetic field around it. Now, here's what's really great. That wire carrying electricity has a magnetic field around it, but not just a field. That wire has several fields all the way around it, all the way down the entire wire. And if you take all those little magnetic fields and you start to coil up the wire, you start to concentrate the magnetic field inside the center of this spiral. Coiling that wire concentrates the magnetism and the strongest part of that magnetic field is gonna be inside the coil, which is why this is the fundamental shape of every electromagnet. And at the lab, we've gotten a little fancy and we've gotten a little crazy and we've come up with more powerful ways, but this shape, this round shape, taking a wire and wrapping it to a coil is just about every electromagnet on the planet, including the MRI. So if you ever go to a hospital and you get an MRI, the reason it's round is because it's just a whole bunch of wire wrapped up in a coil. You go inside that coil because that's the strongest part of the field. And if you could, you can't, but if you could open up the MRI and look inside the machine, you'd see it's a whole bunch of wire carrying electricity. That's what makes the machine work. So Tuesday, March 2nd, we're going to do kitchen chemistry with Marta Chacon Patino, who is a lot of fun. And um, passionate about the whole gastronomy thing. Um, so she'll be on Tuesday, March 2nd. Oh, um, Kristen, what time is this at? Uh, Martha's session is at 6.30. 6.30, same time as this, excellent. All right, any questions come in, Kristen? No, we're great, Carlos. I think everybody gets Magnets 101. All right, <laughs> let's take a history trip, shall we? We're gonna go all the way back to 4,000 BC China, all right? If you, in the archeological digs all the way back there, they have found that a lot of the homes are all situated facing north. And this could be a effect of the Chinese being the first ones to discover magnetism and compasses, 
or the more likely explanation is that the homes are built for solar gain in order to maximize the amount of sunshine that comes into their homes. So in China, it gets cold, they warm up, solar gain helps them warm their houses the best, but we can't say that for sure. It could have been something to do with uh, magnetism. And the reason I say that is because in 3500 to 3000 BC, um, the, the villages that they were building there had a center building, a palace building, that was built on a north-south axis again. And during the Zhu era, Feng Shui actually became building code. Now, I know some of you might be thinking, well, why would Feng Shui have anything to do with building code? Um, Feng Shui was more than just a meditation thing. It was very religious. And it was based off of um, the direction of the home. So we're going to jump to 2000 BC Turkey, um, or at least they say it's Turkey. There's still there's still some debate of, you know, I'm not even going to say it's Turkey anymore. Let's go to 2000 BC Greece, where the story likely takes place. But honestly, we're not even 100% sure it was in 2000 BC Greece either. So, so we're going to go to 2000 BC India. I'm sure it's India, though later on when I find out more information and it wasn't India at all. So, so we're going to stick with Greece because Greece fits best. So so we're gonna to go to 2000 BC Greece and we're gonna tell the story of a shepherd boy. This is the shepherd boy and his name was Magnus. And as Magnus was walking his flock, he noticed that these very small rocks, and it's a Monty Python reference for those of you that get it, very small rocks are sticking to his shoes and his staff and he doesn't know what's going on, but he took these, these very small rocks home and he starts to analyze them and he thinks to himself, what sorcery be this? Why do these rocks stick to some materials and not others? What's going on? So Magnus, who lived in Magnesia, named the rocks magnetite, and that's just a little bit too convenient for me. I don't know if this really happened this way, but this is the story, so we're gonna stick with it. 600 BC, Talus, another Greek, said that all things are full of God, which is very nice, um, and thought that the magnetic objects that he was studying had souls because they could move on their own. So therefore they were living things. We know that the rocks aren't living things, but also Talus also thought that amber was a living thing because as he would rub it and create friction, it would attract some items to static electricity. So poor Thales thought that magnetite and magnets and rocks and amber were all living things because they would move on their own. And he said that magnetism and static electricity were essentially the same thing. This is gonna last for a while. So we're gonna go 300 BC China where traditional Feng Shui was born. And what they did here was they created this spoon that you can see here resting on this plate, but it's not just a traditional spoon. It is a metallic spoon. In fact, it is a spoon that has been made out of magnetite. So therefore it is magnetic and they would spin it around and they would design it in a way so it would actually slot, slow down and end up fading, facing south. Now, we're used to compasses now where everything was very north facing and we want to find out what direction is north. The Chinese actually built the, their, their feng shui around south and they invented a special compass. And this is a replica of the compass that they would use for their south facing feng shui. And they invented the Lupon compass. And, uh, I uh, but it was a south pointing compass that again allowed them to create fortune telling and allow them to um, orient their house in certain ways and the furnishings in their houses. And so Feng Shui was a major part of, of the Chinese um, history at this point. Virtual escape room take two is happening March 4th at 7 p.m. So we've got two virtual escape room opportunities for everyone. And this is also my chance to pause for a second and see if we've got any questions that have come in. Um, we, we don't have questions right now. I just want to remind everyone, if there's something you're looking to learn, put it in the chat and we'll get it covered. I'm also putting some uh, uh, other references in the chat. So um, if you liked uh, Carlos's Monty Python reference, there's a story for you there to go hunt down. And um, of course, you can subscribe to Fields Magazine to get stories of high field science sent straight to your inbox or mailbox. Um, and yeah, we are having a, a, an escape room on a Saturday and 
and an escape room on a Thursday evening for game night. So come to either one, they're both free. Um, you know, if you can't finish it the first time, come back and, and play along the second time. So um, I love this, Carlos. Yeah, you have take one and take two of the escape rooms. <laughs> if you need it. I like it. Oh, I will need it. I know who's making it. I will need it. All right, let's get back into history. And we're in 50 AD now. So we're in the AD, we're in modern history now, when Gaius Plinius, Plinius Secundus, or Pliny the Elder, which is a much better nickname, um, big, big deal in the Roman Empire. He was a naturalist, he was an author, he was a military commander. Um, he wrote the natural history. Now, Pliny the Elder had some very interesting thoughts about magnets, and I, I thought about summarizing them, but they were just so good I had to share them with you. Um, Nature has here endowed stone with both senses and hands. It allows itself, in fact, to be attracted by the magnets. It precipitates itself towards the source of an influence at once mysterious and unseen. And so far I'm like, okay, I'm taking this. I can, I can get with this. It's received its name Magnus, Nick Andrew informs us, from the person who was the first to discover it. Magnus, it is said, made this discovery when upon, uh, when upon taking his herds to pasture, he found that the nails of his shoes and the iron ferrule of his staff adhered to the ground. So, okay, that goes along with my story. So I'm, I'm getting back up. Um, so far, Pliny the Elder is doing all right. The leading distinction in magnets is the sex, male and female. Ooh, whoa, what? And the next great difference in them is the color. I can think of a lot other differences. They're particularly good for arresting deflections of the eyes. Triturated in a calcined state, they have a healing effect upon burns. No, 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 no. That, that's, that's no good, no. Sorry, Pliny, you gotta, you gotta stop. No, no, you went too far. 1086 AD, Shen Kua, um, an astronomer and a mathematician who actually did a lot of his work after retiring from the military um, made the first reference to a magnetic compass for navigation. So the compasses that they used for Feng Shui started to be used for actual navigation. He was also the first to realize that there were some point, some rocks that pointed north and some that pointed south. Of course, now we know that both do both, but he thought there were some north pointing and some south pointing stones, which is, I guess, better than male and female stones. Um, he wrote it all down in a book which translates to Dream Brook Essays, which is what he named his estate that he had retired on when he did all of his writing. Um, 1180 AD. So now we're going to a, um, I believe it was a monk, Alexander Neckham, who wrote the Utensilibus of Instruments. And he was the first European, the earliest European, to write descriptions of a magnetized needle as a guide and also a description of the compass. Now, this is an important distinction, distinction. He was the earliest European, because we've already seen that the Chinese have been talking about this for at least a decade beforehand. And now we get to Petrus Peregrinus de Maricourt in 1269, who wrote the Epistola Petri Pere... Nah, not gonna read that, no. We're gonna, we're gonna translate this. There you go. Letter of Peregrinus of Maricourt to Sigurus of that's not much easier, but he was a soldier and he wrote this letter on the magnet. And here's the deal, um, Peter Peregrinus, apparently rumor has it, had a very close kinship with this soldier and was writing him very detailed, mil um, not military, scientific documents that thankfully were intercepted and got put into our, um, our, our mainstream. So a piece of leather magnet, um, has two sections. Part one talks about the properties of magnets, how magnetic fields can act at a distance. Hey, so far so good. That they can only act on other magnetic materials. All right. He was the first to discuss about poles and how they attract and repel. And he figured out that a North Pole points north and a South Pole points south. So he did good. Part two is actually really impressive. He talked about the use of magnets in various different devices and different types of building uh, um, uh, compass, but he also talked about perpetual motion machines, which it's been 800 years since Peter Peregrinus and we still don't have perpetual motion. I saw Kirsten Knob shaking her head. No, no perpetual motion machines. No, not going to happen. 
All right, you're getting into the fun stuff. Uh, and I love this guy. Um, Girolamo Cardano, an Italian, in 1551, published the Artis Magne Civi de Regulus Algebraeus, which is on algebra. But they shortened that to just Ars Magna, which is a great name and used to be the name of our um, art. Um, our art shows at the Magna Lab was called Ars Magna. Um, the big thing that Cardano did was he dis differentiated between static electricity and magnetism. So now we've got magnetism as one force and we've got static electricity as a completely different force. And of course we called static electricity now, then it was just called electricity because there was no other electricity. He did this by pointing out these five, diff five main differences that using an amber draws many kinds of bodies, but the lodestone only works on iron. The attraction between lodestone and iron is mutual, but the amber effect not so mutual. The lodestone, unlike amber, acts across an interposed objects. And you know this, if you put a piece of paper in between a magnet and the paper clip, it will still attract through the paper, but static doesn't work that way. The magnet pulls only towards its poles, amber pulls everywhere. And that's true, the strongest part of a magnet is at the poles. And amber's force is improved by gentle heat and friction, which does not affect the magnets. So he did all right. And then shortly after him, um, Livio San Sanuto, an Italian geographer, mentioned that Earth's poles are magnetic. He didn't know if they were celestially magnetic or terrestrially magnetic, but he said, hey, we have Earth, we have poles, they're magnets. And he put that into his uh, Geografia. Now, here's the problem. Somebody took issue with Sanuto's writing and they said, and I'm going to read this, Livio Sanuto in his geography discourses at length of the prime magnetic meridian of the magnetic poles, whether they are terrestrial or celestial, treats also of an instrument for finding the longitude, and this is where it gets good. But as he does not understand the nature of the lodestone, he does but add error and obscurities to his otherwise excellent treaties. Ouch! Who would say that? Oh, William Gilbert. Why would he say that? Oh, because he had his own book coming out. Oh, see, William Gilbert was an English scientist, physician, uh, and he was working on magnetism and electricity for over two decades. He was inspired by Cardano and um, Sanuto's work, but he took issue with the non-scientific approaches of Sanuto so in 1600, William Gilbert published the Magnete Magneti. Okay, let's get a translation for this too. On the magnets, magnetic bodies and the great magnet of the earth. Why did these guys write in Latin to show off? That's just the thing they did. So what did Gilbert write? Well, he actually did good critical research. He dispelled a lot of myth. He didn't say that, hey, this is the way it is because there's spirits inside the lodestone. He actually, dispelled the law of superstition. For instance, he proved that garlic does not affect magnets. I know that was a thing, but it's not a thing because it doesn't work. He also showed that earth is a giant magnet and more importantly, that the temperature does affect magnets, which is another big discovery. So he published this um, and this is a repeat slide. So we're gonna go on and we're going to Nicolo Cabello, another Italian, um, observations on electricity. And in his observations on electricity, he pointed out that there were positive and negative bodies that existed. So there was an attraction and repulsion going on with this electricity. I got to remember, this is static still. Um, but he observed these electrical bodies and he noticed that two attracting bodies may contact each other and immediately repel, which is true because in static electricity, when two bodies touch, the charge goes from one to the other and there can be a repulsion effect or there could be a non-attraction effect too. So he's on the right track with this. There is, there is an attraction repulsion going on. And then between 1644 and 1692, every big name in science wanted to get involved in the world of magnets. So Rene Descartes noticed that magnetism is a mechanical thing. And then we got Brown or Brown's law, first use of the word electricity. So instead of just electricity and static, he actually coined a term for it. 1675, Boyle of the infamous Boyle's law, electricity travels through a vacuum. And of course, we're still talking about static here. And in 1692, Sir Edmund Haley postulated that the earth is made of spheres 
and that the motion of these spheres, not all similar at the same time, could lead to the magnetization of the Earth, which is actually really, really close to what's happening. All right, February 25th, Kirsten, Strategies for STEM Inclusiveness. Do you know who's hosting that? Uh, I think that that is our esteemed educator, Carlos Villa, who knows all the best strategies for STEM inclusiveness as someone who uh, runs our SciGirls program and is involved in step up physics. Now, let's not say I know all the best. I know some, I'm gonna share some, um, <laughs> but I, I am still learning. I've got a workshop tomorrow. That, oh wait, no, Wednesday. I've got a workshop Wednesday and Thursday I'm looking forward to. So um, hopefully I'll have new stuff to share for the presentation, so. Yes, and hopefully we'll be inspiring um, new participants in STEM, new future scientists um, of all of all types, right? Everybody, everybody come on to STEM. This is a good place to point out that all the discoveries I've talked about have been made by white men. So hopefully this is something that changes going forward. Um, spoiler alert, it doesn't, not yet. <laughs> But there's still okay. a long history ahead of us, right, Carlos? There's more discoveries to be made, so. <laughs> there are so many more discoveries to be made, but yes, yes, we, we need this inclusiveness. 1820, Hans Christian Orsted. Do you know what they call Hans Christian Orsted, Kristen? He's the world's second most famous Hans Christian. And if you re remember Hans Christian Andersen, um, both Dutch, both very famous, Anderson a little bit more famous than Hans Christian. And of course, um, his uh, Hans Christian Anderson story, The Ice Queen also was the basis for Frozen. So I could have thrown that in too. So, okay, let's give Orsted his due because it is the 200th or it was the 200th anniversary and a lot of cool things happened in the 1820 timeframe. So Hans Christian Orsted working in his lab, this wire carrying battery falls over, the wire lands on top of the compass and the compass points a different direction. And he goes, huh? That's unusual. So he tries it again without the battery, nothing happens. He tries it one more time with the battery and again, the compass deflects. So he realized that an electric current creates a magnetic field and everywhere that you've got an electricity, you're gonna have some magnetism. This was a big deal. Here's the thing, it had been discovered 18 years ago in Italy. And the guy who discovered it in Italy wrote about it in his local newspaper and that's as far as it got. Thankfully, we can go back and find out that, hey, Orsted discovered it and published it and made it out everywhere. And this was a scientific breakthrough. The same year, Andre Marie Ampere, who we have the unit of measurement, the amps for, um, noticed working same idea off of Orsted's discovery, noticed that electrical charges moving in the same direction would attract each other but if they're moving in opposite directions, they would repel each other. So he realized that the direction of the electricity was connected to the direction of the magnetic field. It's a big discovery too. 1824, William Sturgeon, uh, uh, I believe he is a British scientist, made the first electromagnet using a curved iron rod. And this is actually one of Sturgeon's original drawings too. Which is very cool. um, he drew it in PowerPoint, nobody knows that. You have a curved iron rod here, you have a piece of copper wire wrapped all the way around it, 18 times wrapped around it. He ran electricity through that and this seven ounce magnet picked up nine pounds of iron. So major breakthrough, you've got this little itty bitty magnet that's picking up a lot of weight. So that's a big deal. And it would stay a big deal until it became a bigger deal. In 1827, when Joseph Henry, an American scientist improved the electromagnet by taking that copper wire and wrapping the wires in silk. This allows you to overlap the wires. And when you overlap the wires, you can get more turns. Now, it says so real simply right here, the more turns you add, the more magnetic fields you've got, the stronger your magnet's going to be. So Joseph Henry, and, and believe it or not, this actually is, and I'm not joking, this is his actual magnet. Um, yeah, I know it's seen better days, but this is it. It's in a, in a museum somewhere. Um, and, and this is it, and you can see that this is the wire turned many, many times around the original iron rod, and this picked up way more than Sturgeon's electromagnet. So we've got a major breakthrough in electromagnets here. And now we go to 1831, Michael Faraday, and I love Michael Faraday because in 1820, when he read Orsted's discovery, he immediately thought, well, if electricity can make magnetism, can magnetism make electricity? 
And he spent the next 11 years working on that. In fact, I didn't have it here, but in 1821, um, Faraday used Orsted's idea to create the very simplest first electric motors. So Orsted worked and toiled and figured out, and he had a, a, a setup very similar to this. This is not his actual setup, um, but he had a power source on one side, a steel ring. So this is iron and this will conduct um, magnetism. And he had a coil, an electromagnet basically here wrapped around this side of the coil and a separate electromagnet here on this side that didn't have a power supply. And when he turned on the power, he walked and he looked at the compass and he didn't see the deflection. So he got upset, he told his assistant to turn it off and when he disconnected it, he saw the deflection. You see something very interesting happened with Faraday's discovery. If you have a constant magnetic field, you don't get electricity. But when you get magnetic flux, now you've got a little electricity. Magnetic flux, F-L-U-X, one of these great science words. And Kirsten knows that I've got my favorite science words. Um, entropy is another one. Tungsten's one of my other ones. Um, but flux, and you needed a change in the magnetic field in order to make the electricity. So if you turn on the electromagnet down here, and then you walked over, you've missed your moment of flux when it got turned on. So when he disconnected it and turned it off, you had flux because the field was disappearing and the compass deflected. So when you turned on the electromagnet again, it would deflect and then go back to normal. It is the magnetic flux that makes this work. And it's simple to create flux. You take a magnet, you slide it through this coil and you've got magnetic flux and that'll create electricity just like that. In 1831, German scientist Emil Lenz came up with Lenz's law and gave hope to future YouTubers all over the planet so that we can drop magnets through copper pipes and watch them fall in slow motion. So Lenz's law says this, an induced current in a wire by flux will flow to create a field that opposes the flux, essentially saying this, if you drop a magnet through a copper pipe, it will create a current in the copper tube that will give rise to a magnetic field that will repel the field that is creating it. And you've got two fields that are repelling each other, which means that the magnet is going to fall in slow motion or slowly. Um, eddy currents are invented this way. And this is great because we're using eddy currents, not just on YouTube, um, but actually in a lot of roller coasters. If you like roller coasters next time, go to the end of the roller coaster where the roller coaster comes to a slowdown and see if it's got the old fashioned traditional brakes on the roller coaster, or if there are metal bars sticking up from the roller coaster track and the roller coaster has magnets on it. And as the magnet and the pipe interact with each other, it will slow down the train. And that's great because hot, cold, dry, wet, it's gonna work the same every time. Okay, eight, 19, Ooh, we're going to 19 now. Oh wait, no, slow down, go back. Okay, 19, um, two students working in the Netherlands, realized that electrons spin. We knew that electrons orbited, but now the electrons have their individual spin. Now, if you remember at the beginning of this presentation, I told you that the spin of the electrons is what creates magnetism. Well, these are the two people that gave us the idea that electrons actually spin. So this is the explanation that led to the, um, or the, this is the discovery that led to the explanation of magnetic domains and gives us our theory on magnets and how they work. In 1911, Heike Ohns, I'm not even going to try the middle name, uh, I believe a German physicist, um, was working with his new machine that he invented, which liquefies helium, and he won the Nobel Prize for two years later. But he was working with his new machine that liquefied helium, and he was making wires out of mercury and testing the resistance as they got cooled down. Well, the amazing thing is that he realized that some materials don't have any electrical resistance when they get below a certain temperature. Now this must be extremely cold temperatures and this is why the liquid helium comes in because this discovery happened at minus 460 degrees Fahrenheit, which is minus 353 degrees Celsius, which is one Kelvin and extremely cold. And he named this discovery superconductivity. Actually, he called it supraconductivity and eventually got named superconductivity instead. Um, this is what it looks like, all right? So on this line here, we've got resistance. So zero resistance and more resistance as we go up. And this is zero degrees Kelvin and then more heat as we go up. 
So as the temperature goes down, the resistance of this metal also goes down. And this is a traditional metal. But with our superconductors, as the temperature goes down, it hits the critical temperature here, T sub C. And at this point, the resistance disappears completely. And from this temperature to zero Kelvin, you've got a free flow of electrons through the wire with no resistance, which means the electrons are not giving off any impacts or not giving off any energy, which means you're not losing any electricity and your wire's not heating up any. Major discovery in 1911. In the years of 1934, in the background, scientists will be working on this, but there were also important stuff going on in the world of magnets too, including the first magnetic tape, which would be popular and get me through the 1980s and the early 90s. Um, but the 1934, the German invention, I remember my first tape, it was Debbie Gibson. Um, that happened in 1934, which led to the 1946 on a completely different discovery American physicists discovered NMR, which is nuclear magnetic resonance. That would be a big deal in a few years later on. 1948, this is what I was looking for. The Bing Crosby Show is the first radio program broadcast from a magnetic tape. I like Bing Crosby. I know. I would have been better if it was Nat King Cole or Sammy Davis Jr., but Bing Crosby's all right. 1957, superconductors were discovered in 1911. In 1957, we got a usable theory that explains how they work. The BCS theory, which 10 years ago was a good football joke, but not anymore. Bardeen Cooper Schrieffer, and I was lucky I've been able to meet Schrieffer, um, realized that at low temperature, some metals lose resistance, and that is because the atoms are nearly stationary. It's so cold, there's no energy for the atoms to be able to move and cause the impacts that make the electrons lose energy. Additionally, Cooper realized that, hey, going through this superconductor, we actually don't have individual electrons, but we have two electrons that pair up and we call them Cooper pairs. And what happens is, um, the best metaphor I can give you is that it's like one NASCAR and then another NASCAR bump drafting it. So you've got two cars, one behind the other. And the second is using the, um, the wake, the lack of air resistance to be a little bit faster. And that's essentially what happens. Two electrons kind of follow each other and go faster. And of course, two electrons is more electricity than one electron. So you get more electricity out of these Cooper pairs. This is the explanation for the um, um, superconductivity that existed at that time. In 1969 and 1987, we had a number of other discoveries. In 1969, first designed for the maglev train using superconductivity. 1973, the MRI was first demonstrated. Um, they called it an NMR because that's the science that makes the MRI work. But when they demonstrated it in hospitals, people didn't want to be anywhere near it because the N stands for nuclear and people got freaked out. So we call it MRI so that people don't get spooked anymore and uh, MRI is born. 1983, NIB magnets were first developed. Now NIB stands for neodymium iron boron. These are the rare earth magnets that everybody gets off Amazon that you get your finger caught between them and they, they trap and they pinch and they hurt. Or the little steel balls that you put together and you make all the fun shapes that when you should be working but you're actually playing with these marbles under your desk. These were all first developed in 1983. 1987, IBCO, yttrium barium copper oxide is the first high temperature superconductor at 77 Kelvin. That's such a high temperature. That's Minus 321 degrees Fahrenheit, that's still really cold. So high temperature is definitely a relative term. 1994, Kristen, the National Mag Lab was founded in Tallahassee, Florida. We've had 26 years of innovation, 17 world records, some of them listed here, not all of them listed here. And that brings us right up until today. I know it was a mad sprint from the 1600s to here, but we make it, made it here. I want to remind everyone that, hey, one of the things, and you mentioned my side girls camps earlier, we are going to have virtual summer camps this year. And I'm excited to have a new group of boys and girls coming to our camps. We're going to have a um, side girls camps. We're going to have Camp Tesla, which is our co-ed camp. And we're going to have our side girls coding camp because we need more women in computer coding. So that's what we've got. Kristen, did any questions come in?
I don't see any questions, Carlos, but I have to say, you know, this walk through history of magnetism is such a strong reminder of, um, you know, this, this, this prestigious path that we've all been on for, for, you know, for since the beginning of history, practically, right, Carlos? Yeah, I mean, um, since magnets were first discovered and they were first built as toys. I mean, the Chinese would spin the spoons around and Abe, I would love how it would slow down and go back and point the same direction every time. It was a mystifying toy. And in the um, early 1800s, static electricity toys were all the rage. Uh, I remember stories in, um, in the 1700s of Ben Franklin playing with some of these static electricity toys and his brain going off and saying, there's more than just static here and, and the kite experiment happened. So, I mean, I mean- Yeah, Carlos, I think one thing that, um, one thing that you should clarify for our audience um, here currently and a future audience in video form, um, if we release this is, you know, we had this question the other day at our virtual field trip, you know, magnets are basically motors, right? Magnets are what enable motors. Can you explain that a little bit to people? Because that's a whole nother universe um, that people may not be thinking about magnets mm -hmm. in. Again, people come up to me and say, oh, you guys are working on magnets. They're going to be better for my fridge. I'm like, oh, there's so much more. Um, I am sitting in my living room right now. I'm looking around. I can see the kitchen. I can see the den. And I can see the television, the Nintendo, um, the stereo, the microwave, the coffee maker, the blender, all of these machines have magnets in them and they would not work without magnets in them. Every motor has a magnet in it that makes that operate. Um, 1821, uh, Faraday made the first rudimentary motors and he, he was looking for something else so he just kind of left it there. But the, the story of motors is another one that you could go through. And of course, transportation, medicine, um, communications. Your cell phone doesn't work without magnets. I hate to tell you. Next time you're at the karaoke bar, you're using magnets. So they are they are ingrained into our culture. They're all over the place. The computer that I'm looking in front of does not work without magnets in them. And I think that the other thing that I just want to share, you know, both as a teaser for future um, upcoming uh, live virtual sessions, um, but also just as an invitation for people to keep exploring, you know, MagLab content, um, whether it's on our, our, our website or across our social media channels, right? Because actually at the MagLab today, we're leveraging the power of high magnetic fields to build the materials that are going to create the technologies of the future, right, Carlos? Whether they're, you know, magnet-driven machines, whether they're, you know, new materials for devices we can't even conceive of mm -hmm. right now. Um, there's there's Again, some transportation really important research. Medicine, communication. I mean, all these different sub uh, topics or subjects or areas are being um, improved by the magnets that we've got at the lab. Um, energy, even. Exactly. The environment, you know, how we how we can protect the environment. And I mean, so many topics of research that really are impacted um, by the power of high magnetic fields. So I, you know, try to stall for you guys to ask some questions to Carlos. But um, I think that that will conclude tonight's session on the story of attraction. Carlos, thank you for that trip through history. I've put some great um, uh, uh, links in the chat. So if you have enjoyed this session and you want to dive deeper into history, History, uh, you know, explore a deep timeline of, of magnetic related innovations. Um, there's a great uh, a new feature actually where you can kind of explore the areas in Copenhagen uh, that inspired Orsted's discovery of electromagnetism um, hundreds of years ago. Uh, that's in the chat for you. And um, Carlos uh, kind of talked about the power of eddy currents. We actually have a brand new video um, only released on our website right now. It'll be on YouTube later this week, um, demonstrating eddy currents in the fringe fields of the 45t it's really really fun so i saw that, that uh, if you haven't fantastic. seen that one the link it's so great right the link yeah. is in the chat and um i just appreciate you so much carlos uh thank you for tonight's um mm -hmm. session for leading this for all of us and reminding us that electricity and magnetism have a long history and a long future <laughs> now if there's any other teachers in the room that um want to have a virtual field trip from the mag lab they can do that too they go to our website and request virtual field trips um summer camp applications are going to be coming up um, by March 6th when we have our summer camp fair for open house. Um, so I'm going to get my two toys here and I'm going to tell everyone, hey, on behalf of Godzilla and Groot,
Um, thank you for joining us. Stay nerdy, stay geeky, stay true to who you are, and we'll see you next time. We'll Bye, see everyone. you at a live session soon. Come back for another live session.